Having worked in the financial industry for half a decade, I truly believe that wealth was determined by your net worth. However, in the past six months since I quit my job to pursue a more simple life, I've been reflecting a lot on the habits that have led me to this point, especially the psychological money habits that have allowed me to see the true treasures in my life. In life, there is a degree of importance when it comes to being presentable. You most likely don't want to invest all of your money with a guy wearing jeans and flip-flops. Oh, here's a pen. Have an officiant that looks like he has skiing plans in half an hour. I object! But in recent years, I began to notice the substantial financial and emotional prioritization around physical appearance. In my opinion, I personally believe this is to cover up or distract some sort of insecurity. So I created an experiment where I wore a pair of slacks that had holes in the buttocks region and a dress shirt that had a noticeable stain on the back every single day for the last two months of work. And it was roughly a month until my coworker that I worked with every single day finally noticed the stain on my shirt. And it wasn't until six weeks when I had to finally come clean to my manager off the experiment I was running, after the ironic nature of how he was berating me for my physical appearance, when the day prior, he was saying how good I was looking. Now, during this period of time, the comments I was receiving from my clients was that I was very honest. I was very kind. I had a very welcoming presence. They liked how respectful I was and how I always made sure I maintained eye contact with them. And the reason I mention this is to just put into perspective of the true importance with one's appearance. The most just amazingly tailored suit, the most beautiful dress, and the most expensive shoes you can imagine are simply just a facade at the end of the day if you look exhausted, if you look unhappy, if you're not living your life with integrity and you're not taking care of yourself. So I ask myself this simple question every single time I go to make an appearance-based purchase. Does it aid in my life or does it cover up in my life? If it aids in my life, well, this is great. This is an amazing purchase and I don't need to think anything else of it. It's providing value into my life. But if it covers up, well, then I get to see the real issue at hand. Now this applies to most things in my life, but this alone has saved me a tremendous amount of money as very rarely do I spend a lot of money on my appearance as I put the investment into the important things at hand. One of the fundamental principles when investing in a company is to prioritize what the key decision makers are doing. If you want to invest in Google, but find out the CEO only uses Safari, well, <laughs> there's probably an issue. If you want to invest in Amazon, but the Lord and Savior Jeff Bezos only shops at Walmart, that's probably a problem. If you want to invest in Tesla, but find out Elon only drives diesel trucks and litters, well, that's not necessarily in integrity with his business. But when it comes to our own personal life, we look at it as our life. We fail to recognize the importance of the key decision maker. Another great example of this would be we all have that one friend or person in our life that continuously has the same problem, even though we've continuously given them great pieces of advice. We can see it clear as day, their problem, where they are, and the way that they can bridge the gap to get there. Because we are looking at them. We are looking at the key decision maker in their life, or the way that I frame it, their business. When it comes to them, they are thinking, yeah, if I make this decision, then this could happen. But what if this happens? Well, if I do this, then this. They're thinking about it in a life perspective. They're not able to get the distance away to be able to focus on what does the key decision maker need to do? I've began to make this fundamental shift in my life and to begin to do these routine checks with myself and consider or think of my life as a business. I want to invest in this corporation, but I need to see what the key decision maker is doing. So I take a step back and I say, I like the business. I like where it's going. What is the key decision maker doing? Well, he's been struggling with his sleep. 
Okay, jot that down. What is he doing to improve it? Okay, jot that down. He struggles with eating consistently. Okay, jot that down. He is very optimistic and blah, blah, blah. He has very strong shoulders. Jot that down. And before you know it, very quickly, you have a strength and weakness chart of where it is that you are in your life. And now I use this and I kind of put myself back into my life and I think, what these are the things that I can now act differently upon to get my business, to get my life in the direction that I want it to go. Just framing it in the small different way has eliminated so much resistance, so much outside noise, so much chaos that has allowed me to be present in the moment, that has allowed me to see this is what it is that I need to improve on. This is what it is that my strengths are. This is what honestly is just a part of me and that's fine. But it's important to be able to understand what the key decision maker is doing throughout their business or throughout their life. Many of us struggle with two very important aspects in which we live our lives. When to say yes and how to say no. When we look at the very important, very large decisions in our lives, getting married, buying a house, the job that you're going to have, if you're going to have kids, the car that you're going to buy, all of these things take an immense amount of physical resources, mental resources, emotional resources. So naturally, it makes sense that we put a lot of emphasis towards this. I believe that as life has gotten more hectic and chaotic, we're putting even more energy and we're saving the energy towards those big life and death decisions. That's coming at the cost of our yeses and our noes. We're starting to have those just kind of be automatic. Typically we say yes because we don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. And typically we say no because, well, saying yes is kind of scary. If we say no, we know what's going to happen. We get to be in control of whatever it is that we're doing. I know for myself, I personally say no because I want to say yes, but the fear of doing something out of the ordinary is too much at times. So I began thinking, what is the difference between these massive decisions and our yeses and our noes? And I came to this conclusion, and I'm intrigued to see what you guys think of it. When we get married, we know why we are marrying this person. When we buy a house, we know why we are buying this house. When you go to a specific college, you know exactly why you want to go there. All of these big decisions, you have your why. With the yeses and the noes, it's automated. We don't have our why. Why are you actually saying yes? That way you don't build resentment towards the person you continuously give your time to when ultimately you should say no. Why do you continuously say no? In my case, I had a friend that was continuously inviting me every single weekend to go on his boat and to go around on the lake. Well, I continuously said no every single time. I'm busy. I wasn't necessarily lying. But when I took a moment and paused, I dissected, why is this? I was able to uncover the truth of, you know, I'm actually just nervous around being with that many people. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a very quiet, kind of shy person. I'm not used to talking to a lot of people. And to me, that was just uncomfortable. And so now I get to say, well, do you want to face this? Yeah, why? I want to be a better person. I want to develop these skill sets. When we continuously act, or when we continuously ask why, we begin to find the fundamentals of each and everything that we do. I think your yeses and your noes are just as important as the big decisions you make. If you want to look at an, a financial aspect in this, if you understand why you are investing in a company, you're going to be able to see whenever things aren't going well, why you're in that company. I still feel strong with the fundamentals. I don't want to give up on what is happening 
because I understand why. If you're not invested with your why, your emotions, your thoughts, all these things are going to begin to cloud your judgment. I think the more times that we ask why, the quicker that we develop our truth, the quicker that we see why and how we can live with honesty and integrity and be present in the moment. I think, again, the yeses and the noes are incredibly important. I think those are the easiest ways to find what it is that we truly want within. During my time at the bank, there are a lot of memories and lessons that I will forever cherish. One of them being arguably one of the biggest and dumbest mistakes I made while I was actually the vault custodian. Now, this is someone that maintains all of the cash levels throughout the branch. It's a very important thing that you just have to do without failure. One, one time I had a cash shipment of roughly $300,000. I think it was a little bit more than that. What you're supposed to do is you get the cash, you do all these secret things, you put it in a blue bucket, and it helps you make sure that people can't see it, and also helps you transport it. It makes logical sense, right? What I did instead was I said, screw the bucket. It's time for me to be a money man. I want to feel the power of all of this cabbage in my hands. $300,000 is 30 $10,000 straps. It's about that thick and that long or whatever. So this is what I looked like, right? Carrying all of it. And I kind of even had that lean back. I took a step and all of it fell out of my hands. Not only that, every single strap on the $10,000 band broke. So I have cash everywhere. Now, you would think logically, you would get that blue bucket that you should have used in the beginning, you're gonna get on your knees, and you're gonna put the cash in the bucket. Nope. I instead kicked the cash in the direction of the vault. So now not only is there cash all over the floor, there's literally cash flying in the direction of the vault. When I look back at it now, I don't even know what to say. Anyway, that's not the point. I learned one of the most valuable lessons through this experience. Growing up, my parents ran their own businesses. They've always had their own business since I was a little kid. And naturally a part of this, you talk about money. And as a kid, I naturally just heard some of the conversations. When I grew up, or as I was growing up, I always wanted to make sure that I worked very hard for my money. I saw how hard they worked. I felt like I needed to do the same. I thought that I had to sacrifice an immense amount of my life to be able to get in return money. I believed time was money. And so when I was working at the bank, I was working extremely hard for my like 15, 16, $17 an hour. And I thought if I worked hard enough, maybe at some point I'll get a break and I'll make the kind of money that I want to have. I think this mindset is fair and I'm not putting any sort of blame on my parents. This is just the reality that I was living in at that point. There was a complete desensitization when I was just freaking punting that cash towards the vault of realizing the insignificance of the physical aspect of money. As is, I'm, not, I'm not naive to the fact of the importance and the power that money has, but in reality, Money is not scarce in any sort of way. Gold is scarce. Particular things that we cannot recreate is scarce. Money, you can print forever. I got to see the surprisingly small pile of $300,000 on the floor that I was kicking at 21 years old. Now, what happened after this moment was the absolute transformation of my financial journey. When I was able to decouple myself from a scarcity mindset, 
I was able to see the financial gain. I was able to turn my like $6,000 savings account into, I don't know, $35,000, $40,000 invested into the stock market while still making, I don't know, $15, $16, $17, $18 an hour. So my income didn't increase. The way in which I saw money increased. And the key takeaway in this is a lot of us have feelings that when we achieve this, then I will finally feel this. If you have that scarcity mindset with you in, in your finances and you get, you've, you, if you just believe that whenever you get a raise, then finally you'll be able to have enough money to be able to fix all of your needs. When you see that new income, you're gonna to begin to say, well, this doesn't cover all of these new needs. I need another raise, I need more money. On an emotional standpoint, you might continuously be looking for new relationships because they're not able to fit that or fix that hole that you have within yourself. They'll never be able to give you enough because you haven't discovered within yourself exactly what enough is. So my recommendation, and it's something that I still remind myself, is that it's better to fix the hole in the bottom of the sinking boat than to go ahead and set sail on the direction that you want to go. I really wanna thank you guys so much for all of the love and support that you have given, especially with these, these more recent videos. They've been a little bit more intense. I really have been just trying to push the boundaries as much as I can and just be as authentic and genuine and kind as I possibly can. And, and it's, uh, it's been a heck of a journey. So thank you guys so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. $101 for a Krabby Patty? With cheese, Mr. Squidward, with cheese. <laughs>